The world that he gave us is one and only son to save. Oh, God, so love the world that cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Good God Almighty, I hope you find me. Praise in your name no matter what God, because I know Jesus, we have come to worship you today. Father, we are grateful to be here gathered together, singing to you, singing about your amazing grace. Father, let your spirit pour forth on this place today, Lord. We ask that in Christ's name. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Good morning. Give somebody a fist bump or a chest bump, depending on how much you like them, and just say hello this morning. As you're being seated, uh, we'll prepare ourselves for communion as you go ahead and seat somewhere. At home, if you're at home, we ask you to go get uh, some bread and juice or bread and wine. Uh, This is a simple supper. It's always meant to be simple. It's not meant to be complicated. It represents the body of Christ, the bread. It represents the blood of Christ that was shed for you and me. 2,000 years ago, which we cannot change, we cannot add to it. Jesus Christ died for us while we were still yet sinners, so that we could be saints, people of God. So there's communion right in front of you. There's a cup there. So as you know, on the top, the very thin layer on the top is the bread. Underneath is another layer for the juice. As we sing this song, it's about satisfying ourselves each day with God's love. Nothing. Jesus said, nothing is greater than a person laid down his life for his friends. He said, I I didn't just, uh, I just didn't give you instruction about love. I gave you the greatest illustration about love. That I came and lived as a man, fully righteous, died on the cross and rose again. It's not just instruction, it's a full illustration. Here's how much I love you. I'm willing to die to get you back. So as you worship him and prepare your hearts, Do that during this song, and then we'll take communion together when I come back up.
betrayed. He took the bread and he gave it to those he loved and those who loved him and he said take and eat. 
this is my God. On that same night, he took the cup. He said, this represents my blood that is shed for you. It's a new covenant, a new agreement. The Father has made through the Son by the Spirit that all of his people who put their trust in Christ and his sacrifice are not only free and forgiven, but now we're called children of God. Take and drink. Let's sing that chorus one more time as he'll, and he'll lead us in prayer. Let's sing to him. When the sun comes up, satisfy us before the day. for our hearts forget all oh, your goodness satisfy us with your love satisfy us with your love oh, please satisfy us with Father, there is nothing we could add to the work that was done for us. What a gift. What an absolute gift of pleasure that we can enter in. That no longer are we slaves to sin. No, Lord, we are free now. We are free from it all. And we are free to love you. We are free to worship you. We are free to pray to you satisfy us this morning, not just now in this prayer and in this moment of communion, but Father, as we go deeper, Father, satisfy us in your word this morning. All of God's people say, amen. Good morning, church family. My name is Melissa Dunn, and I have the privilege of reading scripture with you this morning. Our scripture for today is 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 7. Please read along with me in your Bible. If you do not have one, there is one on the seat behind you that you could use. And if you, you are here visiting and you do not own a Bible, please feel free to take it home with you. It is our church family's gift to you. 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 7. You then, my child... Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned, unless he competes according to the rules. It is hard. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A few announcements this morning. Please fill out the connection cards which are, which are on the seat um, in front of you if you are visiting or if you attend reg regularly. There are also other announcements in your worship guide. So make sure, and they're on the back, make sure you read your worship guide. And you have, if you have any questions, you can always call the church office if you would like. We have a new transformation verse for October. And it is 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and it is, Teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. It's good to memorize scripture because there's times in our lives when we really need it, it pops up, and that scripture will pop up and we'll know it, and God will work through that. I'd like to pray now for um, Pastor Todd and Jackie Belay who will be coming up. So let's pray. 
Father God, I just uh, lift this church service to you. I praise you for your Holy Spirit being here, Father God. I thank you for this church, for this church family. I thank you for Pastor Todd. I pray that you speak, your power speaks through him today, Lord, that hearts are open, Father God, and that we remember everything that you have taught us through him. Thank you, Father, for the shepherd that he is to this church and how he sees us as his sheep and he loves us, Lord. And Lord, I pray for Jackie today as she comes forth and shares her testimony. I pray that it is so powerful and that people hear it, Lord, and that you speak her, your peace into her, Father God. Thank you for Jackie and her life and her story that is your story that you have given her to share, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Would you welcome Jackie this morning? As you saw, the transformation verse should be 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, so apologize for that. 2 Timothy 2, 2. The cards are different places in the building. If you want an actual physical card, or you could put it on your phone. But this is what we're going to read together, memorize together this month as a church. But we're going to take that verse, hopefully, and we're going to pray it for one another and for other people. Jackie is one of those people that's been living it out for a while. So, Jackie, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I've attended at MCC for about 15 years. And I'm a church member, and I was baptized at Presque Isle uh, in the summer of 2009. And I've been married to my husband, Mike, for 30 years. And we are greatly blessed with two young adult sons, Cody and Nathan. So, Is that when you, uh, that time period, is that when you became a Christ follower, when you got baptized? Or had it been a while, and then you got baptized? Yep. Um, I was raised in a Catholic home, and I went to church, but I considered it to be obligation. I just did it because that's what I was taught to do. I didn't desire to grow deeper or to look into God's Word. So in 2004, my family moved from Girard to a neighborhood very close to here, and I met one of the neighbors, um, came right up to me. She was my age. She has two children that were my children's ages, and that mother was Karen Lentz. And she walked alongside us, and God just used her greatly to bring my family to Christ. Mm. So she introduced my children to children's ministry, Awana, Vacation Bible School, and invited us to church. She introduced me to women's Bible study, and through that, the Lord just got a hold of me and grew me and gave me a desire to learn more about his word and to grow um, just very thankful for her, and mm. since that time, I've served in ministry, I've worked at the church here, and I just want to give back to God for mm. what He's done in our lives, mm. so. Amen. The second question, just to, to follow up that as it comes on the screen here, as you started to grow, uh, how's a D group, a discipleship group, grown you? Hmm. Well, in 2016, as I said, I worked at the church, and Yourself and Pastor Brad had introduced D groups, and you modeled peer journaling for the staff, and we did it and learned it. And then we were encouraged to invite a couple people to walk alongside us and to meet with us regularly. And I immediately thought of two people, and those two people were Lisa Fetterman and Cindy Weiner. And we pretty much meet together to this day. Um, our group has changed. We've had people come to our group, leave our group. I've actually been in different groups, and we're back together. So mm. um, another person that asked to join our group is a younger generation mother, and that's Lisa Dugan. And it's just nice to walk with her through her season of life because mm. we've all been there, and we can support and encourage her. And just this week, uh, Another person joined our group, and that's Kim Owens. Wonderful. So she's just, I've known her for many years, and we're just very excited to have her in the group and mm. see how that goes. That is the biblical model. Older women, just a little bit older. Younger women. <laughs> Thank uh, you. <laughs> that's the words that are used in the Bible. <laughs> older women teach older men, teach the younger men. Yes. Mm. Final question. Uh, see here as it comes up. I forgot what it is. We'll see. Here it goes. 
What changes in your group have you made to grow deeper? Mm -hmm. Well, the group itself is just phenomenal. These women are always available. They're always truthful. We can discuss things in our lives. God puts things in our lives to create dependence on him. So we all have issues, and we have family, we have marriage, we have children. Um, we're very transparent with each other, and it's just so nice to have those people. We had been doing here journaling for probably three years almost, and somebody in the group just said that maybe the here journal was getting a little bit routine for them, and we talked about it, and we said, yeah, we, we could change this up, so... We did um, a study by Angie Smith. The name of that study is Seamless, and it just describes every book of the Bible and how it's woven together for God's plan for our salvation. And we finished that one, and she introduced a second study called Matchless. So we went through that study, and it actually uh, describes Jesus' life on earth. Mm. And just this past summer, we did something kind of challenging and we read C.S. Lewis's book, The Screw Tape Letters. And you had talked about that last week. Yeah. And we were glad that you said C.S. Lewis is like a scholar because we had to look up half the words <laughs> in the book. And my book is circled with meanings. But you have to do that to get the concept of what he's saying. And this book is just Satan's perspective of how he chips away at our Christian witness and tries to destroy us very subtly. So it's a great book for discussion because it's a lot of little chapters, each with a theme or a topic. Um, so it's not scripture, it's not scripture, it's not biblical, but Cindy Weiner said, every time we read on a topic, let's look into God's word and bring scripture to the meeting. Yeah, so that's that great. was just awesome that we, we did that. And that book was written in 1940, but it's so applicable today. So it's just amazing to go through that and be aware of Satan's attack on us. So. That's, that's powerful. One of the things that we wanted to communicate, uh, 250 people uh, pre-COVID were in discipleship groups. We're not quite sure uh, how many are still meeting. If you are and you're available to meet with someone else, let us know. But one of the things we wanted to communicate that after a few years, even a spiritual discipline can become a routine if the mm -hmm. spirit is not working and we're not following him. So sometimes we stop and pause. We read large groups, uh, large texts of scripture, or we read a book, or we start serving. And one group decide to serve for a month, so they serve in downtown. So just listen, listen to the Lord about how He's working in your season of life, but also who's the next person uh, to bring in the group. One way a group will grow stale is if it becomes a holy huddle, and uh, it never prays for anybody, never looks out to anybody else. So, uh, Jackie, I've noticed you over the years. You are very uh, aware and concerned about other people, and mm -hmm. they're not connected in their needs. And so I just want to say we see Christ in you. Thank you. You're welcome. I see Christ in you. Thank so. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. May we pray. Sure. Father, as we go to the Word, and as uh, Jackie has said, uh, we are here to be uh, people who know you, grow in you, and then go for you wherever you send us. Use us to be a part of your mission across this world, how we can advance the gospel, the good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Jackie, thank you. We are in 2 Timothy, as you see. This is Paul's last words on earth. Uh, when someone gives us their last words, it's worth looking into. Jesus' last words on earth, or some of his last words, were go make disciples. So his last words are to be our first priority, go make followers of Christ. Not about numbers or attendance or consuming, but how many people are knowing me, growing in me, and then going in me. That's the call. You know, in sports or most things in life, it's easy to measure success. In football, we know that you got to get the football across the goal line. Basketball, you have to put the ball in the hoop. And soccer, you kick the ball in the net. In most things, it's pretty clear how to be successful. Even in the business world, you must make money to stay alive. You can have other parts of your mission, make a big difference, give money away, uh, create jobs. But if you don't make money 
very long, you don't have a business. In the gospel, we must know how Jesus measured success. He never measured it by megachurches or by money or by programs or how many things the kids have that would satisfy them. He measured it by how many people know me are growing in me and then going in me, going for me across their community, their neighborhood, and the world. That has been a big debate in America for years. We've talked about it many times. Are we successful because we have 10,000 people? No. People are, it's great to have more people. It's what are we doing with the people? How are they ending up? Where are they becoming? What are they becoming? That's Jesus' focus. That's Paul's focus. His last words to this young man, Timothy, are, go make disciples. He just says it a little different. He tells him that he is to carry on the gospel, the good news that he received. You remember Paul's conversion was radical. It was radical. He was going about 100 miles from his home to kill some believers. He'd already helped kill some. He'd already helped put some in jail. He'd broken up families. He had tore up children's lives. He was a bitter, angry man. He hated Christianity, so he's traveling a little over 100 miles on Damascus Road, and God meets him there. He knocks him to the ground. He blinds him, and he says, why would you persecute me, the risen Lord? He brings him to himself. He immediately gets discipled by a few people. They train him, equip him, apprentice him. Then God does something unusual with Paul. He takes him to a desert, gets him away from everybody else because he was so filled with his religion that he grew up with, his rules, his rituals, his sacraments, that he thought could make him good with God. God put him in the desert of Arabia for three years, taught him personally, grew him up. Then he places him back with another group of people who began to walk with him and disciple him. And then he goes on to what we have called for years the Apostle Paul and his ministry. He writes over half the New Testament. He gets the gospel to Europe. The reason why you're a believer is Paul was called to go not to Spain where he was headed, but he went to Europe. And Macedonia, and then the gospel took off from Greece into Europe, and you got the word of God through your forefathers and foremothers that came to this country and built their first city based on God's word and Jesus Christ risen from the dead. That doesn't make us a Christian society. It just means that God planted the gospel here and blessed us richly. We are privileged in this country to grow up with the good news of Christ Jesus. 1.5 billion people, if you use the name Jesus with them, they would not know who you were talking about. There are thousands still of unreached people groups. They do not have the Bible in their language. They do not have a local church preaching the gospel in their language. What we have here is so, it, it's getting rare. It's to be treasured. So Paul tells Timothy, this young man, I want you to grow in a few ways. I want you, first of all, to grow in grace. You'll see that on your note sheet. The Bible is in front of you. You've got that Bible you read. I hope you have it out or your phone, or the text is on your sheet. We want to go through the Word, right? We want, Jesus said in John 6, 63, my words are spirit and life. Just reading His words will give you life. But to take them and hear them today and apply them will give you life. So Paul tells Timothy, grow in grace. The last words on earth are some of them. Of all the things he said, could say grow in, grow in church planting, grow in becoming a better speaker or listener or whatever, he says, no, what you want to grow in is grace. Keros is favor, approval, loving kindness, a place of acceptance, belonging. Grow in understanding that God has showed his favor to you. He has brought you into a place of belonging. He has brought you into a place of loving kindness through Jesus Christ. Grow in grace. Verse 1, you then my child. You see how personal that is? Timothy was his child in the faith, child much younger, and he had poured his life, Paul had, into this young man and other young men and then sent them on, sent them on their way to start churches and be about the mission. He's, he is... Uh, he loves this man. He, this is, I would say, one of his favorites, if not of his favorite child in the faith. He loves Timothy. 
He's cried over him. He's walked with him. He has prayed over him. He has taught him over and over and over. In, in Paul's imprisonments, Timothy is often there. As he gets out, Timothy often goes with him to the next place, not knowing what will happen to him. My child, be strengthened by grace. The Bible says a lot about being strong. I, I love that Joshua, right, was told to be strong in the Lord. Moses had died, and Joshua had watched this great man of faith lead Israel for 40 years, and now he's gone. And the Lord says, be strong in me. Be strong in me, Joshua. Don't back up. Don't be afraid. Joshua could have said, all the enemies in front of us are bigger, more, greater. They've got better weapons. They're all taller. They all this, that, whatever. But he said, no, I'm going to believe you. I'm going to be strong. Well, Paul reminds uh, Timothy, be strong, but it's be strong in grace. No God favors you. No God favors you, Timothy. You can just hear his words as he's in prison. Paul's in prison. He's probably chained to a Roman guard. It's interesting. He's going to bring up soldier here in a minute. He's, he's chained to a Roman soldier. He tells Timothy, be chained to grace. Abide in it. Bathe in it. Walk in it. Because this world's hard. The attacks in your mind, in your heart come. Satan will attack you. The flesh will attack you. The world will attack you. Timothy, not everybody's going to like that you go into a town and say Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. You better know God's favor. Know he approves of you. Know you belong in him. And it's in Christ Jesus. It's in Jesus Christ who came and lived a righteous life, who died and rose again. A man here recently asked me how to give a blessing to his children. I so admire him. He wants to write uh, emails or notes to them and leave it behind of how he wants to bless them like the Old Testament saints. They would bring in their children, lay their hands on them, meaningful touch and words of affirmation. Smalley and Trent wrote about the blessing years ago. We've, we've talked about it many times, and he, he's getting towards the last part of his life. He wants to leave some last words with his children and grandchildren. That's what Paul's doing here. You know, maybe you have some last words to share with people. I mean, we don't know when our last words will be. Maybe today's our last day or whatever. But some of us know that we've got less life ahead of us than we have behind us. So it's important to tell people what we really want to tell them and show them what we really want to show them. That's what Paul is doing here. But if you'd write this down, you know this. Much is caught more than taught. Much in life is caught more than taught. He wanted Paul, that Paul wanted for Timothy to see his love for Timothy. He wanted Paul, to, he, Paul wanted Timothy to say, I know I'm loved by somebody. I know I'm loved by somebody. And, he, and Paul encourages him to grow in love with God. Here's what grace does, Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. Notice this on your screen or your note sheet. Because of the great love, just turn to somebody and say you're greatly loved. Just turn to them. You say you're greatly loved. You are not loved. You are not loved. You are greatly loved. Greatly loved. Paul, in another place, says he's lavished his grace and love. It means he's poured it out abundantly over and over like a waterfall, not like a spigot, like a waterfall. He has lavished you with God's his grace and love. You're greatly loved. This love that greatly loved you, he brought when he loved us. Paul wants you to know, if you didn't hear me, he loves you. He greatly loves you. And even when you were dead, I mean, you had no response to God, no care for God. You didn't think of him. You might have talked to him occasionally. You know, when I get older, I'll come to you. Or if I get in trouble, I'll talk to you. But you didn't follow him. You didn't love him. When you were dead in your trespasses and sins, he made you come alive. He rebirthed you like he created the universe. He created life in your soul. And he did it with Christ, who died for you and rose again. It is by grace you have been rescued. That word rescue means from all things. Rescued from death, rescued from sin, but most of all, rescued from yourself. You don't have to be in control of your life anymore. This gives you significance. Would you underline that word or circle it? It makes you valuable. You have been given life because Christ died for you. You have significance in Him. You have value, identity, worth. No one can take that away from you. Now, we can hand it to them. We can give it up, but no one can take it from you. Your value and significance is what God has declared about you. It's interesting, before Paul says, here's the steps to go teach somebody, he says, you must become somebody. You must become somebody before you go teach somebody. 
grow in grace, understand who you are and the significance God has given you. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace, God said, is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast, Paul said. I'm going to boast when I'm weak because that's when I see more of God's strength. You feel out of control right now? You feel insecure? Feel like things aren't going your way? Paul said that's the time to boast. Only a supernatural work can cause that to happen. Paul said, I'm boasting now that I'm weak. He, some kind of situation he's in again that he's weak, he can't control it, things are slipping, things seem to be going downhill, and he said, I'm weak again, I'm broken again. I'm going to boast that God is strong. That gives you security. Just circle that. No matter how weak you become, by your choices or by someone else's choices, God will show his strength. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to make all grace abound to you that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work, not just get by, not just make it to Friday, not just get to the weekend but that you would abound in every good work. That's sufficiency. Just circle or underline it. You have sufficiency at all times in every place to know Christ and to represent him well. And then finally, uh, from the Old Testament, there's all kinds of these and from Numbers. He says, uh, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Just circle satisfaction. There's a lot of these prayers in the Bible, and we just sing a song about, Lord, satisfy us in the morning with your love. The, the Jewish prayers, <clears throat> it's amazing how much when God gave them a prayer, how different it was from their religious ways. It was satisfy us, abide, we want to we bathe in Him, we want to be uh, covered with the rain of His grace. When they made up their own religion, it was very rules-oriented, very, very sacramental. But He said, it's like the sun coming up in the morning and hitting you in the face and you smile. Grace satisfies you. Knowing that God favors you satisfies you. Todd Beamer knew that. He was one of the people on the plane that was headed uh, towards the Pentagon. He uh, called his wife and he asked her uh, to read the Lord's Prayer with him and to pray it. And they finished the Lord's Prayer and they went through Psalm 23. She recited it, if I remember correctly. And he said, I, I don't want to want anything. The Lord's my satisfaction. And so they went through Psalm 23, and they told her he loved her. And he hung up. He didn't say much more because she was pregnant. And all we have on the recorder is he looks at the people with him, and he says, let's roll. They stormed the cockpit, took down the terrorist, and took down the plane. And as far as we know, that's his last words. I'm going to give my life for this. Let's roll. How did he do that? Because he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not have to want for anything. He leads me in green pastures. He makes me lie down. Right? He does all those things. He's my satisfaction. This is a calling here for Timothy. Walk in God's grace. Two, walk in the investment in others. Grow in investing in others. Grow in investing in others. You see, disciple-making is an intentional investment. We organically impact people, but we are to intentionally give our lives to impact people. We give our lives to them to see them love God, love others, make disciples. You'll see there, it's a circle. We invest in them. We want them to love God. We want them to love others. We pour into our kids, our grandkids, our neighbors, or people in our groups, and we want them to love God more. We want them to love others deeply. And we want them to invest in other people. It's organic and intentional. At the baptisms, you know that we give this baton away. It says invest. And you can buy one if you want. It, or you can have one, actually. I, we'll give it to you. Don't tell anybody. We'll give it to you. But it's, I think it's 2 or $3 dollars. If you want to put it up somewhere, remind yourself you're here to invest because everything's better in heaven. Worship's better. Preaching's definitely better. Communion's better. Fellowship's better. Everything's better in heaven. So if you're here one more day, it's to invest. And I have it right up on my bookshelf. And I've talked to many of you. I've given them to many of you. And we give them to them at baptism. Because at baptism, you've announced not just Jesus is my Savior, but Jesus is my Lord. I'm going to follow him, whatever he tells me to do. Well, you say, what's he mainly tell me to do? Right here he says, invest in someone else. 
Invest in someone else, whoever's around you. So you see verse 2, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, what you've heard from me, Timothy, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, in this text, is men because it's church leadership, but you'll see as it goes through the Bible, teach others means the men were to teach the men, the women, the children. The men, women, children would go teach men, women, and children. And so it goes on and on and on and on until the Lord comes back. You notice there's four generations, if you just write that there, there's four people or four generations. What you, Timothy, heard from me, many uh, to faithful men, teach others. So you, me, faithful people, teach others. So we're all the way, we're all the way across the goal line when we're thinking four people or four generations. Who am I going to invest in that I'm going to encourage him to invest in and I'm reminding that person or she to invest in the next person so that it goes on and on and on. The church has not functioned that way for decades, but now there's a revival. There's a revival in America. There's a revival across the world. You hear the word discipling, following Christ much more. God is doing a revival in the mess of our world. And it's about pouring in and investing into other people. All of us here are spiritually to have children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. People that we can say, you know, I invested in her, and she invested in so-and-so, and she invested in so-and-so. It may be that this stage of your life, that it's more about prayer than meeting with people. So pray that way. Pray for four generations. Pray for four groups of people. Pray for four individuals. Just let's take this seriously. You, me, them, faithful people, teach others. So this blue card, this D group card, just pull it out for just a second. On the side, what is a discipleship group? You see, a discipleship group is a group of three to five people of the same sex. Men meeting with men, women meeting with women. Our community groups are mixed Uh, people, men, women, young or older, anything that God puts together in your community of people that are near you about a group that you can talk about the message and grow deeper and serve the community. But a D group has one goal in mind. We're going to disciple each other so we can disciple someone else, so they can disciple someone else. Now, if you're meeting two or three men, two or three women, and you're not wanting to disciple other people, call it a Bible study call it a men's group, call it a ladies' fellowship, call it anything you want, but it's discipleship groups that are meant to be reproducible to hand the baton off to someone else. This is not the only way to do it, but this is a biblical way to do it. We are going to ask you to the structure of a D group to review your highs and lows, get people talking. Sometimes I'll ask the, the men I meet with, and we all share leading Eventually, everybody wants to lead, so you can multiply. We do not split groups up here. We do not divide. We multiply. So just say it. We multiply. Healthy cells multiply. If you're not multiplying inside your body, there's something wrong, right? Healthy cells multiply, and they multiply health unless you have a disease. Now, you can multiply the disease, and the disease would be that we're not concerned about Jesus' last words on earth. Go make disciples. But we're here to multiply, and so we get together, and we all talk. What's your highs and lows? What made you laugh this week? Is anything God's been doing anything? We just get talking. We pray for God to work in our lives and and invite Him into the meeting. We review and recite Scripture. We focus on our groups, meant to focus on the transformation verse. I pray this verse for you and others all month long. If I take this verse, memorize it, and I, and I recite it, and I pray for you, and as people come to my mind, we change the verse. People often ask us, you've memorized the ESV. It's a little bit different. We make it a little easier for the teens and for the kids sometimes if it's a little harder. So you, you memorize it, or you memorize Scripture that means something to you. This week, uh, no, the last few weeks, I've been memorizing John 15. So I've been thinking about abiding in Him again, praying faithfully, being uh, a person that walks in his love and his truth. So, recite something. Learn something. Share the here journals. We'll get to that in a second. And then you pray for someone to know Christ and pray for someone to come in the group. How do you start a group? Well, you go participate in a group. Get invited. It's much harder to sign up for a D group and get you fit in the right one. We will do our best and pray. But if someone invites you, I hope you'll say yes. I hope you say yes. I'm ready to grow. Because we're either being discipled and or discipling somebody. 
we pray about who would God have us next in the group. If you ask God, God creator almighty, is there any person in this city that you love that you'd like me to invest in? He will show you. That is not a prayer that will fall to his knees without being heard. It'll fall to the ground. You ask him. He'll, he'll show you. And then approach those individuals. You covenant with them. We'll send you a covenant, and you begin to invest. So on the other side, the here journals, there's an example of a here journal. It's very simple. You highlight something from the passage that God spoke to you. I put two verses there. You'll see in the middle the example. Jesus washed their feet. He told his disciples, this is the way you go love. You explain the text so you know that how that passage fits in the big part of the Bible. This is not an encyclopedia. This is God's story. How does this passage fit in God's story? You want to make sure you hear it. You personalize it. You see the application, third paragraph, the Lord Jesus made it clear to me. He made it clear to me that the depth of my love will be in the degree in which I serve people. And then finally, you write a response. It's a prayer or praise. You can hand this off to anybody. Again, there's hundreds of people doing this. You're teaching your children, grandchildren. You're teaching people. There's many people at work doing this. Way to go. This can go on like a baton again, handed on for generations. As God speaks to you, you want to pause once in a while. You want to read a book, read large passages of Scripture, go serve somebody, then come back and hear the Word again and start journaling again. Just listen to Him. He'll guide you. But get involved. Who's in your life that you can invite that one year from now, they would know Christ better, they would grow in Christ more, and they would end up going for Christ because you helped send them? There's nothing more exciting. I'm going to say it one more time. You know how to make a group stale? Just stay together. Everybody say amen. I know it's hard for some of us because it's our friends and so much is going on. So here, if you multiply, do this. Split four and four. Oh, I said split. Multiply four and four. Two and two. Go this way. Go that way. I meant go directions. You go this way. You better go this way. Take a friend with you. And by the way, you don't have to quit being the friends of the people who multiplied the other direction. You can actually eat with them or go to ball games with them or do things with them. So I'm going to ask you one more time, is there anybody in your mind or heart that one year from now, they could look more like Jesus because of you? They could look more like Jesus because of you. Anybody on your heart? Anybody on your mind? Anybody in your neighborhood? Child, grandchild, friend, person at work, school? Anyone? Paul told Timothy, grow in grace, grow in investment, finally grow in faithfulness. Grow in faithfulness. Look at verse 3. Share in suffering. He said, this is going to cost you some. You'll have to give up some things, and some people will persecute you because of your message. Share in suffering. Be a good soldier of Christ Jesus. He didn't just say be a soldier. Be a good soldier. Be a righteous soldier of Christ Jesus. You know, soldiers give up so much. It has been a shame to watch this year how dishonored the police and the army and different people are. It's just, it's a disgrace. There's bad cops, there's bad soldiers, there's bad pastors. But overall, most people I know in those kind of ministries serving, they're, they're putting their life on the line, they care about people, they're investing in people. They're to be honored. The Bible says they're to be honored. They give up a lot. He tells this young man, he says, Timothy, you won't have a cushion life and easy, and you'll have to get up some mornings to go meet with somebody in some late nights. You'll have, to, you'll have to give up some things, and you'll have to suffer sometimes if you really want to see somebody grow in Jesus. The first analogy he uses is a soldier, and he says, don't get entangled in civilian pursuits, but please the one who enlisted you. Roman soldiers couldn't own a business. They couldn't even get married. They had two goals. Roman soldiers had two goals. Make Rome great, please Caesar. Paul says, we're not here to make Rome great. We're here to make God's name look great and to please our commanding officer, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the goal. 
And then an athlete, verse 5, he said, an athlete's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. He said, not only are you to be like a soldier, you're to be like an athlete. In other words, you can't make up your own rules, Timothy, to the gospel, or what part of church you'll accept or not accept, or what part of the Bible you'll accept or not accept, or what part of the call, the commission you'll accept or not the rest. He said, you don't get to do that. If you do that, you won't be crowned, bema seat. That's what it is, the bema seat. It's the award seat. He said, your salvation's not in jeopardy. It's how many rewards you'll get. The Bema seat is different than the evaluation seat, the judgment seat. We'll never go before the judgment seat. We go to the Bema seat. We're already an athlete on his team. It's just the rewards we'll get by being faithful. All of us, by the way, will hear, welcome home, good and faithful servant. It's the blessings that come after that. He said, don't make up the rules or you won't get the same rewards, the same crowns. And then verse 6, it's a hardworking farmer. Now, the farmer is the least sexy person on here, right? I mean, everybody wants to be a soldier. You want to be an athlete, get the gold medals. But a farmer just gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning, goes out and feeds the cows and moves the manure and plants the stuff and comes back in and all muddy and messy and does it again the next day and the next day. And if you're a dairy farmer, you do it every day till you go home and Jesus comes. He said, uh, it's not sexy, most of the time, this kind of thing called discipleship, it's behind the scenes. Of many, many people won't even know what you're doing. You only have a few you're investing in. But be a hardworking farmer. Don't be lazy in investing in people's life. He said, if you want to be lazy, be lazy in something else, Paul tells Timothy. Be lazy in something else, but don't be lazy in investing in people's lives. Don't be lazy. Hardworking. You see that adjective be a hard work. Go at it with God's grace, and you'll get the first share of the crops. I was watching a pastor on TV recently, and he was talking about the prosperity gospel, and he used this text, and he says, if you do what God says, God will make you rich. I don't know how he got money out of this text. There's no money or water or anything else here. This is not about any of those things. You know what this is about? It's the old saying. If you teach somebody, you learn more than they do because you talk. He says, you want to know Christ well? Pass it on. You want to grow deep? Pass it on. You want to be mature? Teach somebody else. You get the first share of the crops. You'll walk away many times and say, man, I was more blessed than they were. I was glad I studied this week. Lord, thank you for speaking to me again from that passage. I've read it a hundred times, but thank you for speaking to me again. You, you care for me. Whoever teaches learns the most. I just want to end. In Paul's day, they took an oxen, an older oxen, and put it with a younger oxen, and they'd put uh, the, the board over them, the plow, to get ready for the plow. And you had to have an older oxen who had done it before, who had walked the straight lines, who had plowed the fields, because the young oxen wanted to do his own thing and go off each direction and do his own thing. So you put a younger oxen with an older ox, and you say, walk the straight line, and you teach them to walk straight towards the prize. You pick a tree or pick something out there, and you have to have a straight line, right, to plow the field, walk towards the prize. Paul's last words on earth. Some of his last words were, Timothy, walk towards the prize. Find somebody to yoke yourself with. Pour into them. Give them an investment of eternity. It's the only investment nobody can take away. IRAs go up and down, salaries go up and down, all, everything on this earth goes up and down. Matter of fact, one day everything's going to be burned up, but not our investment, not our investment. Father, thank you. As we sing this chorus again, just about who you are and what you're doing and how you work, I pray we'd sit for just a minute and thank you. Thank you for investing in us that Jesus Christ gave the largest and greatest investment, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Thank you for his commitment towards us. So I pray now that his love will flow through us to a few people, that we'll disciple, that will be our apprentice, that we'll mentor, and they'll go way beyond us, way beyond us in the faith. They'll look more like Jesus than we ever could. They'll impact more people than we ever got the opportunity to do. Father, thank you. Thank you for all the stories we're going to hear in heaven. Of all the people who will have been impacted because we took your word seriously. Show us who to invest in. 
like that, huh? Are you, do you not feel set and ready to go? I hope you're not just going to sit on the sidelines. Because as athletes, we can do that. We can sit here and we can listen to our coach say, yeah, go, go, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we sit right back down and go. I pray we don't leave here to just go back and sit. I pray that wherever you go, you go with Christ. 